a runaway since I was 14 years old, you know, been on my own since I was, you know, 14 years old, you know, streets and prison. Eight years ago, I just thought, like, it's ridiculous, man. You know, I, I, I can't be doing this no more. Pretty much uh, it's time to learn how to grow up. I have a criminal background, and it was really hard for me to get a job. And I was getting depressed because every time I would go to look for a job, I couldn't find one. I just got out of prison. You know, I did 20 years straight. I'm 54 years old. I'm just working. I've been having a lot of trouble, you know, getting a job because of my convictions. It also kind of made me grow up a little bit, you know, to be more responsible being in there because, you know, you have a choice to act bad or not. Tammy Chan, in charge of our special projects, came to us with this idea of we could get a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. The idea for this project came out of watching ex offenders struggle and knowing we needed to provide some meaningful job training component. And the thought occurred to me, maybe we could do an art project that had some kind of skills-based training. Oh, wow. That's gorgeous. I think art gives people hope. It helps them to see color and beauty where sometimes ex-offenders may only see darkness and hopelessness. This research shows that people in prison exposed to the arts are less likely to reoffend. With training, they can do anything. They have value from the National Endowment for the Arts helping us and to utilize ex-offenders. That's great. I think pictures have so much life to it. The details, everything just kind of pops. It's cool. <laughs> Art is uh, something we have started to put an emphasis on in our community. It is something you don't have to have, but I think the lesson that has always stuck with me is when I go up to some of the great cities in our United States, New York, Chicago, Boston, some of those, and you walk through some of the city infrastructure, parks and streets, buildings, and you see the art. Much of it was done during the Depression, some of the times that were worse economic conditions than we've ever had in our country, and yet they managed to put art out there. There's two funding components. One is the National Endowment for the Arts, which is paying entirely for the participants' time they get paid while they go through training. It's paying for all of their training materials, and it's gonna pay for some fabrication time once they get some training in Pam's studio. I get this phone call from Tammy one day, two years ago, and she's, uh, she's asking, Pam, would you be interested in uh, talking to me about a large mosaic project and a National Endowments for the Arts grant for the city of Grand Prairie? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> And that's how it came to be. Miss Tammy had uh, told me about the arts grant and she asked me if I wanted to participate in it. And I was, at first I was like, well, let me talk it over with my family. So I was talking to my aunt and she was like, that would be something for you to get into. So when I got into it, I was kind of skeptical because I really didn't know nothing about art. You know, the older guys used to tell me, man, you got a whole life ahead of you, man, go to school. I see myself telling the younger guys that today, you know, I'm thinking it's going one ear out the other. Use it for what it's worth, you know, learn everything you can learn out of it. It's like a once in a lifetime thing. If I go to prison again, I know I'm gonna die there. That's not what I want. I want to try to make it out here and just work like everybody else works for their, for their money. I'm just waiting for someone to give me that opportunity, you know, give me that chance. Good morning, glad we all made it over. So we're at the Kimball Museum. This museum opened in 1972. Fortunately, Connie has some handheld so that as we're walking through the permanent collection, you can find the painting that you're looking at many times and it will give you a little brief history of what you're looking at. Upstairs, we're going to see statues, paintings, reliefs, anything that you can imagine, like we talked about, mixed media, watercolors, oils, all that sort of thing we're gonna see here this morning. That's Judas hiding. Real human, because what do we do when we get embarrassed or? We hide. 
That's what I did. Yeah. Isn't it funny how human nature stays the same? I know at least three people have picked their favorite. Did everybody have a chance? Mine is John Simeon Hardin, the young student. And basically, he's just like us, starting out, learning how to draw like we are. And he also did the same way. And it comes in the fact where it has the value, where uh, the painting comes to light to dark. And it showed a lot about how um, later on he used to um, copy everybody else's, but eventually later down the line, he ended up having his own painting. And eventually it's the same with us. We're gonna start off doing other people's drawings and eventually we're gonna have our own masterpiece. Rembrandt was the one that I liked the most. He was remembered as being the greatest Dutch painter in the 17th century. But what I liked about his painting was it was not, a, I mean, he wanted to take your mind off not being a commissioned painting, but rather than the person's character. They taught us how to be a photographer, really. We learned how to take pictures. They was teaching us different angles and, you know, lighting and, you know, the darkening and the lightning. And pretty much just tell you something that we feel that could be timeless or something. I liked everything about it, really. Coming to class, making the frames, cutting the wood, the glue. It was a new process for me. My inspiration for my pictures came from the photographers that were teaching the class. This is the high point right here. I mean, you have your art shown and people come by and they acknowledge your work as, you know, something that they like. So, I mean, that's the high point to me. The next step, we're learning to do the tiles. We're going to be doing a bridge off 30 and Beltline. But the bridge is going to be the first one in Grand Prairie. So hopefully it looks good and they hire us on to do some more work for them. I spoke to one of the participants this morning and he has sold four photographs from the show and the show is still up. Really, I just got lucky and took the picture everybody wanted. <laughs> and what happened? Well, I had three people asked to buy it. It really doesn't even matter. It's just that I know I came out number one in the class. <laughs> we brought in Five Star Flooring, a local tile company to work with the ex vendors and train them. Artex Americas from Mansfield did some technical training on the exact mortars and grouts and they even spent a day with them at their training center. We orchestrated a workshop for the City of Grand Prairie participants. We provided all the material, all the tools, and every student gets their own little table when we do hands-on out in our workshop and each student must participate in actually applying the product themselves with our supervision. This is one of the best classes we've had because the enthusiasm level and the energy was so high that we never really had a class that people were so proud and glad to be a part of. We are going to make a pretty big mosaic, 10 foot mosaic. And this one is going to be the prairie flower mosaic. We're going to create the pattern. We've already discussed um, the designing within the computer. We have to have copies of the pattern so we can cut up the pattern and use the pieces to make the individual tiles. Yes. We've cut all the tile. I teach them how to finish the tile into nice, pretty, soft edges. And we fire the tiles, and then we glaze the tiles, and we fire them again, and every time we do all this, we have to put it all back together like a jigsaw puzzle. Then they will mount this large 10-foot mosaic in sections on concrete board. It is the experience of clay. After the workshop, then we can start focusing on the installation of the large uh, Prairie Grand Prairie ribbon mosaic. After I got the design approved, I was working with Arteic to get the color palette right and get the shape right 
And one of the great things about the technology today in this particular company, their computer software turned the design into mosaic glass tile. They have a robotic system where they load in all of the tiles into this fabulous machine. <laughs> It comes in 12 inch squares. It's face mounted with plastic, the European style of installing mosaics, and it will all come in boxes with a template. So this is the same color palette, but this is taken from this little spot right here. The environment that I come from, we were poor when I was very young. My dad didn't even get to live the, my age. He died at 47 of cirrhosis to the liver because he had a drinking problem. My mom, she passed away also at 57 years old. She died of cancer. I was selling drugs for many years, making a lot of money. But I knew that one day, you know, I would have to pay the consequences for what I was doing. I did what I did and sacrificed what I was doing for my little brothers and sisters to feed them, to bring money in, because um, I was too young to have a job. Because of the drug abuse that I had, it was only trying to take the pain away that I had felt for so long. But when I was five years old, I was already an adult, if you understand what I'm saying. I got arrested and went to prison and did four years came back out and went to the same environment, the community where I was, I fall off at. Got arrested again, three times. So this time I had to do like 15 years straight. It's like you live a life so long, you get so used to that life. and You gotta get yourself out of that to get used to living right, the way you're supposed to live. When I got out, I made a decision to stop what I was doing. I had to make a decision to get out of that community. A mosaic is only as good as its installation. It's a concrete retaining wall. There's all sorts of bubbles and little holes and little undulations in the, in the concrete. It was never created for a work of art. I apply the pattern to the wall then I will tape off what is not going to have mosaic on it. Then we have to put a water barrier product on the wall because you don't want water coming in from the back of the wall, which would release the mosaic. So we're going to use a concrete tilt wall filler. We're going to trowel on and we're going to smooth out and we're going to fill all the divots and all the little imperfections. Here we are, we are laying the first course of tile on the corner. It's kind of like the cornerstone, you know, when you're building a new building and you can, oh gosh, I wish I could put a secret message in there <laughs> on the corner. <laughs> I have a 13-year-old son, and I'm just trying to do the best I can for my family. I know my son needed me, and I wasn't there for them. And my children's mother, she passed away of breast cancer. So they grew up without a mother also. And then I wasn't there for them. So for today, I'm here.
especially since now I got kids, you know, it, it's a lot different. You know, I look at it from a whole different perspective. You know, knowing that I got two mouths to feed and two people that depends on me, that plays a big part of my decisions I make. Whole new responsibility, huh? Big one. Times two. <laughs> I think they got a system down and got a rhythm, so this, today we can have multiple teams going and I think they'll go much faster today. One of the things I am particularly thrilled about seeing you know, are the blue bonnets. I mean, the blue bonnets really started coming alive as well. I mean, I could start seeing them. I mean, we can see a ribbon. But this is, you know, you just think pixelation. And when you stand back and even just across the street, these beautiful colors, you know, the lights and the warms and the purples and the blues, you, you actually start seeing it. real proud to say that we've had several get hired, replaced them. We're down to six and they've all committed to stay with us and not take a job so they can finish this project. If folks don't have a second chance and they come back into your community, if they don't get housing and a job fairly quickly, they may go back to what they were doing. We can change lives. People have been changed by this project. The artists from the Association of Grand Prairie Artists, Dallas Camera Club, Pam and her staff, I think everybody's been changed as well as the participants and myself. It's not just a beautiful project for the city, it's a beautiful thing for people. This is a very good program for offenders. It gave me a better outlook on life that I know that there are people out there that will give you a chance. No matter what your background is, there are people that will give you a chance. And I have really enjoyed this and I have really learned a lot working with Miss Pam and I feel that it's going to brighten my future. When I got my first paycheck, you know, I got a check, I said I had to take a picture because that was my first paycheck ever in my life. And it felt good, you know, having a paycheck, working. Now I want to work for my money. I learned how to get along with everybody. I just feel good about getting up and coming to work, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's what I was wanting to do. I, you know, I look at my mom, I look at my dad, you know, and if they take two days more than that weekend off, they're like lost, you know, I, you know they need to go to work, you know, and I, that's the way I want to feel. This is a life-saving program for people who, who come, you know, from the jails or, or just people who actually need help, you know, trying to get themselves together and stuff, you know, that there is hope.